Cool. Well, thank you for coming out tonight. I know you have your choice of interaction design lectures on a Wednesday night. And <laughs> thanks for choosing mine. Uh, so yeah, I um, and thank you for the beautiful poster, which I uh, I don't know who made if the person who made that is here, but oh, it's so beautiful. Thank you. I texted it to my mom, and she just <laughs> freaking out. So thank you. Um, cool. So yeah. Um, I'm going to talk tonight uh, about uh, essentially how we kind of got to paper three on the iPhone. Um, the first half of this is really kind of setting up some of the design decisions that we had to make when we got around to doing that. Um, and the second part of it is, is a kind of walk through all the tools that we ended up using. We ended up having to develop some tools um, for prototyping and production uh, to make that possible within the studio. So it's kind of a a sort of why and then a how, uh, and roughly throughout the whole thing. So, um, so first, uh, prototyping. I think so. The definition of prototyping. I think um, somebody give me a somebody. What's a prototype? Anyone? Conveys your idea. A what? It conveys your idea. There you go. Conveys an idea. So. Prototypes can, I think, convey ideas. They can answer questions. Um, that's a good broad definition, I think. Um, one thing that I think prototypes are often sort of looked at as just a scaled back version of the thing that you're trying to make. And I think prototypes are, they're a lot broader than that. I think what we'll talk about a lot is sort of um, seeing prototypes as part of a system of design. And really, the point of that system is, uh, is getting from A to B. So a, getting from A to B is essentially what my experience of like job of a designer is all about you're standing on top of this thing and like your client is like there's this other thing that's higher and we want to go there so it's either your client or you have to figure out what that thing is um, but there's somewhere that you want to go and and there's this giant sort of space in between here where there's just like cactuses and nothing so you either have to figure out how to, you know, you're just gonna like pull a Wiley Coyote move and like get across the canyon with a bottle rocket or something, or you have to figure out sort of little steps um, to get across there, or kind of figure out how to climb up there in a clever way. And that's, that's really what prototyping I think is all about. It's kind of getting from one place to another. So point B for paper has always been uh, represented, <laughs> it looks like we have no direction, but, um, <laughs> Point B has always kind of been represented by this, which is a uh, what we consider sort of a diagram of the creative process. So uh, at the beginning, you're starting off and everything's really messy, and then things start to, to kind of hone down, and then eventually you're in this part where, where you're just like in production. And the insight, essentially, that, that the company was founded on was that the tools that we're using to think with and the tools that we're using to be creative um, often sort of sit uh, like a little too far to the right here. We're sort of using things that are designed for production, like Photoshop and Illustrator, um, to do things where you really want the cognitive burden to be like very low. And what people end up using for a lot of brainstorming and um, you know, when they, when they want to have an idea, they go back to really simple tools like paper and pencil. So we wanted to do something that was just as elemental and simple and um, and kind of just like platonic ideal of a surface to like get your thoughts onto. So that's always sort of been our, our vision. Um, so, so the first expression of that vision was an iPad app. And uh, we called it paper. So it's, uh, you guys are assuming nobody came tonight if they like, have never seen this app before, because that wouldn't be very interesting. But um, so we, we launched this iPad app. It, it's uh, feels like Moleskine journals. It's um, sort of very uh, high refinement of kind of feel applied to it. Uh, and it was, it was very successful in a certain way. So it won a lot of awards. There were a ton of downloads, profitable. Um, and so in that, in that way, it had sort of achieved the end that we set out for it initially. Um, but being a tool, uh, one of the kind of beautiful things about tools is that you never know what people are going to do with them. So we had a particular purpose in mind, which is this place for people to capture ideas. And by ideas, we meant ideas, like any idea that you would have. Like if you look in your notebook right now, what's in there? It's notes. It's 
sketches. It's probably like bus tickets or something. If anybody takes the bus, but um, but what people were doing with it were just these very different things. Like this was um, we started to get you know videos like this, which this came from a Czech theater, and uh, this guy. I mean, this is something we just we, we never could have possibly thought someone would do with it, but they're just projecting paper on the on the wall, and then there's another person sort of using it as like a spotlight. And um, at a certain point, he starts like playing with the interface, and we were just so blown away by this that we actually created a mode in the app so you wouldn't have to see the toolbar. Um, so for anyone who wants to do like experimental theater with our app, they can. <laughs> Kind of a niche, but it's our niche. So, um, so things like this, um, just really interesting expressions. This was something that we, um, you know, people made really amazing artwork with it, like much beyond what we thought they could do. This is a kind of a sketch, which is still a pretty cool sketch, but it's even cooler when you see that the guy who did it wrote in, and this was it's a tool that he had found. It was just sort of the simplest thing to use. He's paraplegic and. Um, and this was just his app of choice for, for its simplicity and being able to, um, to draw with it. So um, two, like someone took it to Bhutan and gave it to these little monks. And this was just like the awesome, most awesome user testing that we've ever, these are kids who've never seen an iPad and probably potentially never seen anything like a digital interface before. And they give it to them and they just, you know, immediately launch in and draw a little monkey on there. And so, um, you know, it's that's one of the really gratifying things was to to kind of lose control over what we what we had intended. Um, but there's sort of uh, sort of a little downside to that as well, which is which is this: um, we were always butting up against this kind of barrier. So every time we'd put something out, people would be like, "Oh, I love that new thing, but I can't draw. It's such a shame I can't draw. Otherwise, I'd I would love to use your product." And you know, we never intended it, you know, there are things like Procreate, and there are things that if you really want to draw, then these things will give you much finer brush control, like much, many more brushes. They're just, they're designed for drawing. Ours is a really good drawing tool, but it wasn't, we didn't intend it ever to be solely a drawing tool. So um, when we realized that we had kind of hit the ceiling on, um, on people being able to use the tool, um, you know, it was one of these sort of fundamental things almost. So I feel like when people say they can't draw, and I, I can't draw, like I drew this presentation. So it's like you can see <laughs> how poorly things are. But I, um, even after like many years of being there, I'm still a pretty poor illustrator. But, but I don't try, that's the difference. So if you, <laughs> if you uh, there's a lot of things that people are kind of told when they're younger. Um, I think these sort of innate abilities that people feel like are just part of who they are, your, your athletic ability or your, your ability to do math or to draw or to do music. Those are all things that obviously we, you can learn, but people just have this kind of coded into them. They're like a teacher told it to them when they were you know, 10 or something, and now they just believe that the rest of their life. So there was this barrier to, to change. Um, and so we you know, um, immediately were like, well, we'll just we'll change that barrier. We'll change that perception. So we. We took that as a challenge, and we launched Mix, which, um, if any of you have seen, Mix is a, it's a community where you can put anything out there. Everything becomes uh, Creative Commons public domain. And then you can very easily um, just kind of click and open something and remix it, which is just drawing on top of it, and then share it right back out. And then you can see all the chains of people who, who have drawn on top of that thing. So. Um, it's this way in which like, the sort of main barrier that we would hear from people is that the blank page was really, I don't want to sit in front of the blank page, or I, I don't have a half hour to draw something, so, or more. Um, and so what we were trying to do is create something that, that kind of removed all those barriers. If you wanted to just open up, well, you can see what people have done here. Like, some people have done really elaborate things, but you can just pick something up and, and color it in, and that's fine, and send it back out. So it, it's kind of defeating some of the notions of authorship that were intimidating to people. It was defeating, I think, some of the barriers of um, like having an original idea and things like drawing as being this process where you have to be an author with an original idea and sit in front of a blank page and do that. So that was, um, that was what we did with Mix. Mix became um, 
a pretty vibrant community in its own right. Um, we had two million accounts. We have two million accounts still. Um, it's uh, a lot of unexpected uses there. These uh, <laughs> these Spanish schoolgirls got a hold of it. That's um, I guess you know a lot of social networks are blocked and. This is a social network that wasn't blocked, and also like you can't scan it with any sort of software to like see what people are writing. So it just essentially became like note passing in Madrid, for, like this middle school, <laughs> and it was it was really pretty amazing to spy on it for a little while before we. Um, so after that, we uh, we came out with with ThinkKit, and ThinkKit is um, ThinkKit is essentially a way of uh, allowing you to create kind of perfect objects or semi-perfect objects within um, and draw graphs and diagrams. So it's, tr again, trying to shift the purpose towards someone who's like, well, I'm not an illustrator, but I do I do, do visual communication for my job. So I can, um, maybe this is a tool that I can use for that. Um, this was, again, like something that we, we spent quite a bit of time on, the guy who, Developed this, we called him Dr. Curves for a while because he's a guy with a PhD in curve fitting, and that's his whole job. He's a math professor at Yale, so it's like there's some pretty intense um, kind of math that goes into these types of things, um, and it's again like a product that we're that we're kind of working working to improve, and it did expand the audience to a certain extent. At the same time as we're developing all these things, uh, we were experiencing some platform issues. So um, this chart is, I know, somewhere Edward Tufte is not, not angry, but just disappointed. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, so this is, the, the kind of light blue line is iPad sales per quarter and the um, dark is iPhone. So, and it, it's, it's roughly accurate. I put a little thing under it when I drew it. So it's, um, the iPad, you know, when we launched, it was still a platform that was growing, and um, and people were using a lot. The iPhone came out of the gate really strong um, earlier. This it, its tail goes quite a bit back, um, and it just continued to you know build strength upon strength. So um, when we started to do research, we found that um, people were not really using the iPad that much at work, and we found that. Um, you know, iPhones had grown to like 800 million in the market or 700 million in the market, and iPads were kind of like staying flat or tapering off. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of reasons for that. Like, people don't drop them when they're walking out of the subway and things that people just don't buy new ones. So, um, so we we knew that we needed to get onto a different platform if we were going to reach this goal of being this thing that people reach for when they when they need to express an idea. Um, and I think this is this kind of gets at like one of the biggest things that I've learned from being at a startup, and it's um, a different experience than I had previously, where I would finish a project and move on to the next project. Um, in this, it it often sort of feels like this: you can you can finish something, you can sort of get to, you know, you don't know what you're doing, and then you figure it out, and then it's working great, and then you're like, oh man, there's an even bigger problem here. So it. Um, you're, I think where we had gotten were sort of a series of like local successes, but we hadn't really tackled this big problem of being this thing which has a real ubiquitous presence with people and it's just a tool that, that is like your notebook or is like a piece of paper that you just reach for when you need it. Um, so, um, so that's where we were. We found ourselves at point A after sort of doing all those things. Um, point B was getting out kind of to a place where we could um, where we had that, that type of ubiquity. So what we did over the course of about a year and a half was uh, come out with Paper 3, which is a universal app. Works on the iPhone, the iPad. Um, this is a little what it does. I didn't realize this music was here, but. It um, has some interesting text interactions that we prototyped. Um, so the three modes are text, photo, and sketch. So this came out of uh, a lot of user research that we did, um, looking at the way that people took 
notes. Um, a lot of people were just screenshotting things. A lot of people were like going to Ikea and snapping a picture of the little number on the cram fours or whatever they wanted to buy. And um, So we wanted to make something that, that took in all those different formats. Um, a good little tour of what it kind of does. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, so the way that we um, got there, the first thing that you'll notice is that is, if you guys use paper on the iPad, it is significantly different. The journal metaphor that um, the first one came with um, is, is absent from that. And um, it has different media formats. There's much heavier, the default when you open it up is text on there and for when you're on the phone. Um, drawing on the iPad, but there's some pretty massive changes that it underwent, um, and it was really kind of a complete rebuild of, of paper, um, except for sort of the drawing surfaces. So uh, paper is all built in OpenGL, so there was sort of a massive development effort um, to get that underway. But sort of one of the things, um, because paper is, I, partly because, because it is built in OpenGL and because it's, it's, it's a big kind of ship to steer. So uh, I think in the time that we've been there, we, we rarely ever throw out uh, production code um, just because it's, it's really hard and expensive <laughs> to build anything in that code base. So, um, so we have to, as a design team, make sure that what we want by the time we end up asking um, the engineers to build it is like exactly what we want. Because once they build it, we can't, um, it's very expensive for us to change our minds. So, uh, so what that means is that we took some of that investment and we put it into a prototyping team, which is, uh, I think, proportionately to where we are, one of the larger prototyping teams I've worked with. We have three people um, who serve the New York office, uh, two of which are ITP professors or, alum or uh, SVA professors or alumni, Anit Pitaru, who's a professor here and thesis advisor, and James Patterson, who's this kind of long time collaborator, and then Eric St. Onge, who was a rock star student of mine while he was here and continues to be a rock star everywhere he goes. So, uh, so that's our prototyping team in New York. And, um, and then there in Seattle, there's a hardware prototyping team, which is different. But really, their job is to come up with very high fidelity prototypes for things. Um, and it's, it's, as a designer, it's like the most amazing resource ever to be able to kind of, you know, draw, like, state what you want, um, which often is just like, sometimes can be like napkin sketches. <laughs> and then um, because of the framework that we built out, like things, uh, I've had experiences where I like leave a meeting and get back to my desk and there's a different prototype waiting for me there about what we were just talking about. So um, it's, it's a lot of investment in, in the prototyping system, but I think it's been, it's been worth it for, um, for our process because of where we are in terms of the way we spend engineering dollars. So, um, but the way I, to describe this process of prototyping and what I mean by it's a, a sort of a broader, um, broader than just making these technical little uh, <laughs> prototypes, broader than making these sort of little versions of the software, I think uh, the way that we think about it is really as a system. So you come up with some principles, which are the things that you sort of want to test against. And this is how, uh, for us, we figure out what we want to prototype, because from those principles come questions. So those questions, you know, the more specific, the better. With, um, but those kind of questions, like you figure out what the most urgent question is, and then you try to figure out how much you need to do to get that question answered um, with, by technical means. So, there's a few different reasons, I would say, to prototype. Um, you know, there's anything from the types of like intelligences that we bring to bear in products. Uh, there's like st strategic validation is something that is maybe not a good thing to prototype immediately. Um, aesthetic, you know, visual design is something that you can prototype just with um, comps. Um, motion is something that you can do in After Effects. 
uh, I think the thing that prototypes are really good at and um, is sort of this feel, which feel is something that like, we'll come back to at the end because we invest a lot in that as well. But it's something that it's, I think it's one of the sort of hardest intelligences to have as a designer is to know how something's going to feel. And um, you know, even after like I have a lot of gray hair and I've been doing this for a while and I'm still wildly wrong on things most of the time. So, um, so prototyping is really this process to to kind of get you into those into those places where you can actually feel what something is going to be like, which is almost invariably surprising. Prototyping, we know what that is, but we'll get to that. And then proof, which is really just what are the tests? Um, how are you once you kind of once you have these principles and you make these prototypes, how are you going to test them? How are you going to prove? How are you going to check back with those, with those principles? So, so for paper, um, our principles, we have a few here um, with cute little illustrations. And uh, the first one is fast. So fast is something I think we're, we're always optimizing. Um, the, the metric that we had is that I had gone, I tried to go, um, on a little motorcycle trip, which I didn't get that far because I have a really old motorcycle and it broke. And, um, and I was, had to call a tow truck and I was like in Norwalk, Connecticut on the phone and like 11 o'clock at night. And, um, and the guy, the tow truck operator was like, I wasn't even, they were like, okay, we're gonna give you a number. You got something to write that down with? And I'm like, I'm like pull out my phone. I'm like, what app am I gonna reach for at this moment where like, you know, I'm just, I'm stressed. I'm like, I just need the thing that's gonna like be the least amount of bullshit and just like get the number into it. And that's like, and I didn't reach for paper in that moment, well, partly because it wasn't out yet, but <laughs> so, was, that ended up being like the story that we're like, let's be that app. Like, let's be the thing that is, uh, it's just like the piece of paper where you like find in your pocket with a pencil. And um, so speed was a huge thing for us. Organize later. So we didn't want something where you're like, I want a new note, and so I'm gonna like make a new folder, or like name the note, and you know create this thing. So anything that felt like sort of a file system, like we wanted something where, again, you just make it, and then maybe it's a mess, but like when you have some time later, you can fix that. So it goes kind of hand in hand with speed. Use with one hand was uh, something that was really hard to stick to for a while, but we gave ourselves that one. Um, we wanted something that you could, you know, be on the subway with your hand on the pole and like and work it and do pretty much everything in the app without having to like get in there and do anything with two hands. So um, again, yeah, that was a hard one to stick to, but I think ended up being a good one. Uh, works at all sizes. So this was something. Largely, this was kind of a constraint of our development effort. Um, we're still not a very big company, so. Um, as much as we would like to have, I don't know if we would like to have, but multiple apps or, mul or different kinds of apps, um, we really uh, were given the constraint that we needed to have like one app and it had to be a universal app that would just work at um, these different scales and it also had to be like somewhat future proof for things like the iPad Pro and um, any sort of weirdly sized things that come out. If we get onto Android, there's a whole multitude of different sizes, so we couldn't make anything that was gonna be really constrained to a single form factor. The other one, which was really counterintuitive, um, was to assume a first time experience. So um, we had, I think, 15 million users um, on for the iPad, and, but then looking at, the, at an iPhone market, it's just so much larger. Um, that you have to assume that a lot of people who come to this are never have never seen paper before, so they've never um, gotten really used to um, any of the metaphors within it, and you can't really assume that they'll know anything within it. Uh, this is like I think living, like having worked on this product for so long and kind of breathing it all the time. This is kind of a hard one to break away from, and um, it's not that we wanted to, you know, just completely cut off our previous user base, but. We also um, had to assume a lot of, you know, that most of the people coming in were going to be new. Um, and you can see, like, to be honest, you, uh, if you look at like our app store reviews, there are the people who were using it before and have used it for many years. There's uh, a fair amount of like discontent with 
with what was going on there. So whereas like you can see all the people who downloaded it for the iPhone are like, what's everyone talking about? This app's amazing. I can't believe it's free. And then people who use it for iPad are like, why did you change my app? So it's, um, there's a tension there. And I, and I would say, you know, we're even in the release today and we're working to sort of resolve those tensions and, um, and to do things that will kind of help bring along the, some of the things that people loved about the app because we do, um, of course, want to, um, want to bring everyone with us. Uh, so this brings us to prototyping. Uh, so prototyping is a pretty robust process here. This is so small, but um, so prototyping, we use a lot of different tools. Um, we kind of use anything from uh, origami, like Keynote is probably one of the most frequent. When I got there, After Effects, because there was so much interest in film, um, Andrew, uh, has a site called Shore of the Week and a background in animation, as does Alan. And so we just, we, the original prototype of paper was all done in uh, After Effects. There was like a huge After Effects file that like every interaction was done through it. Um, and that's sort of evolved as people like me have come on or Amit and people who want to do more kind of code prototype stuff, um, which has gotten into, uh, the development of a whole framework that we have called Scout. So Scout is kind of a mashup of um, a few different things. It's a framework called Ejecta, which Ejecta was originally a game engine that just essentially gives you like a canvas object, but it can run um, natively. So you can write with JavaScript as if you're writing for like Canvas, but access the, the low level graphics processing. Um, it just it lets you essentially just make fast graphics with a JavaScript. Um, there's an Objective-C wrapper, so you can run it um, on the desktop. You can run it as a native app on a phone. Um, it has C++ bindings, so we can get into um, most of paper is written in C++, so we're able to kind of interface any of the like, code that we have, like drawing libraries or anything like that, can just piece right in there. Um, and then JavaScript, which is kind of like the meta language for the whole thing where we can people like me can go in and um, play with it. So, so this is kind of what a Scout environment looks like running our prototype. Um, you can see you, you just write it in a text editor. Um, you can see it in a browser on any of the kind of like JavaScript debugging stuff that you get with the browser is, um, is available to you. Um, you can see so you just save, and then the browser just auto reloads. So you can make changes like extremely fast on this system. Um, and then this is the loader that comes up on the phone. And then those, those prototypes can just be pushed out to the loader on the phone. So, um, so anyone in the office can go and, and um, get the latest prototypes on there. So um, this is a system that we use so like when we're really in production, there'll be you know scores of prototypes on there, and they come in really fast. Um, and yeah, so it, it, so we ended up making um, really an end-to-end -end prototype, which uh, I'd say the reason that we did that uh, the, the prototype that we have, which I'll show you, and I have a phone up here if you guys want to come play with it afterwards, pretty much does almost everything that the app does. Um, at a fairly high fidelity, and that was because we really, like, knowing that we were going onto this new model, we really had to do a lot of user testing, we had to do a lot of internal validation, and it really wasn't enough to just kind of do, like, little origami prototypes of things in isolation. It was, you sort of had to have the feeling of, like, being able to walk around with the app and do stuff with it. Um, so, which was kind of a tough task, but fortunately we had built this framework up, and it was up for it. Um, we started with a few different prototypes. Um, we had, so the way this process started out, which was kind of fun, uh, was like a prototype rally. We just, we had like three different directions that um, we came up with. This is one that I made in Swift. And uh, the three different directions were people, pocket, and what do we call the third one? Sharing. Um, so P 
people, the direction was essentially that um, the idea behind it was that there would be like no journals at all. And we would just, like when you created something, then you would swipe it over and you'd be able to share with like a feed of people. Um, so it'd be almost, it's almost like a messenger client direction we were talking about. Um, so Pocket was one that uh, Eric St. Ong actually made. And um, this one has kind of more, you can see like a linear organization that's organized by time. It's a little bit like the camera roll, I would say, on your phone. Um, it was also, you can see, this is kind of the first appearance of the, the page that's always there that, um, that made it into the final thing. Um, had a back button. That was kind of one of our big things. Was like, how do you get, how do you get around? Um, so this this I believe was done in Scout, <laughs> but, but you can see some crazy UI ideas going on there. Um, so we went pretty broad. You know, we these are just things that like we had two weeks and we each came up with like here's our concept for a direction and then we just go out and bang out prototypes and and come back try to impress each other. Um, this was sharing prototype. So this has a lot of, you can see this, this is starting to really feel like the final one. I think something that this has, which is really um, influential, were these grids. And um, you can see that's actually, if you've used the app, it's, it's very similar to the grid that we ended up with. Um, but. This is something that, um, this is mostly James and Andrew prototyping on this one. Uh, James is just phenomenal. They're both phenomenal. Everyone, everyone but me in that little group of three people is a great programmer. Um, so one of the things that you can see um, that, that Scout enabled in this thing is that these grids, um, like the grids are rearrangeable in that and they'll, they'll reflow. Um, the content in subsequent prototypes was loaded live off our, through our API. Um, the drawing engine that we put in there was actually our paper ink engine that we just kind of fused in with these prototypes. So there are things that, uh, that we just couldn't do with uh, anything like Framer or uh, any of those types of like, which are great for doing like motion, like smaller motion study prototypes, but for what we wanted to do, um, which was this kind of like much more robust simulation of the app. Um, using our live data, uh, that was something that we ended up, Scout was kind of the only way we could do that. Um, so this was actually, I think, the final prototype, which um, has, so uh, Eric St. Ongen made a, like kind of all the creation stuff, so all the photo stuff, the inks, all the text prototyping, all that had been kind of prototyped separately and he just fused them together into this and it, it was pretty realistic at the end of the day. We made some design changes, but this was something that we could walk around the office with. We could start to give to a beta group. Um, we could really start to prove out. So um, the final step of this is, um, I was talking earlier about feel, but feel is something that we take very, very seriously. And uh, to, I think feel is also something where you can create a huge amount of tension between designers and engineers. Um, I think we have, you know, we have engineers at 53 who really care about this and realize that it's part of the value proposition. Um, but it can be like, if you, don't, if you don't do what we did here, then you can have like, the alternative is to have a designer sitting behind you in like the last few weeks before it goes out and just being like, can that be a little faster? Can that be a little bigger? And like, it's a way to get strangled for sure. So, um, so uh, to minimize, Strangulation. We've built this. Uh, we've parameterized pretty much everything in the app. So um, this is like a small fraction of the things that are parameterized. Uh, and you can just pop these open, and what you'll see, you know, in the like weeks before we release something, is just all the designers just twiddling those sliders, and it's adjusting everything from the the lighting to the gravity to the color of every little element on there. And and that's I think how you hone feel. And feel I think. Um, one of the best sort of examples of feels like when you, in video games, I think, video games, I think they pay a lot of attention to feel and it's like, you know, the way like when you hit a brick, the way that brick shatters and the sound it makes, um, if that is not done in a, in a way that's satisfying, then 
that can make the difference between that game being good or bad. It's just, it's that little kind of, um, it's almost like, you know, unexplainable little psychological thing that just makes something feel good. Like when you, when you open a journal or when you open a stack, like it's something that um, I think you really have to pay attention to. So finally, proof. Um, so we went out and did quite a bit of research um, once we had these prototypes. This was actually at ITP, and um, we just brought the prototypes out, and there are people who'd used paper, people who hadn't used paper, but at this point, the prototypes were robust enough that we could, we could test them with people, um, see what they thought. Um, we, uh, we used uh, usertesting.com. How many guys used usertesting.com? Amazing, right? I don't know. <laughs> it took us um, a little while to discover it, but I, I will like happily endorse their product in glowing ways. It's, um, it just enabled us to, to deploy, um, deploy these prototypes, like whereas before we had to take a whole, you know, it took maybe like a week to recruit people and schedule time in the office, and then you take like a whole day, and it's three people and one with a camera, and then we had to like do all the stuff. Um, Whereas we would just you know plop these prototypes on there and send them out, and then like literally within a couple hours you have these perfect videos that you can then like annotate, and um, and the other thing about these I think is I mean sometimes there's no substitute for having people in front of you to really uh, get that you know to, to further interrogate something with them, but a lot of times like people I don't think I mean especially when it's in your own office. Like it really takes balls to walk into like someone's office and be like, "This product sucks," you know, and like no, even in New York, like no one will do that. So, um, especially when you're trying to validate a lot of things, um, which like when we put it on user testing, people are just as rude as they are everywhere else on the internet, you know. So you like throw it out there, and they're like, "Wow, this product doesn't make any damn sense," you know, and then like cut the video off, and you're like, "Thank you." So. Um, so yeah, it's great. It's like unfiltered, semi-unfiltered. Uh, and the last thing that we did was um, we set up a Slack channel and big Slack users. And we just invited um, a number of users um, who were kind of, they were like heavy mix users and kind of part of our community. And we, um, we just set them up in there and they, and just kind of let them use the product and um, Tell us what they think. It actually ended up like we had done this before, where we'd give people data and then we'd send them a survey like two weeks later, and no one ever answers the survey. So, it I think with this it felt much more. They were just much more engaged, like a higher percentage of them, and um, and it really kind of you kind of developed a relationship with people. Like they would have a problem, and then you kind of work it out with them, or um, it just was. It felt like a much better sort of interaction. So. A lot of it was, um, you know, we went through quite a few months of just having these prototypes and cycling back and seeing, like, is this fast enough? Is this, you know, are people using it correctly? Is it going to get us um, to the place that we wanted to be with these? And then kind of adjusting as we went. Um, so I'd say sort of like the final thing. This is just a quote that I like, Ezra Pound from the Cantos. And, uh, it, this kind of brings us to like where we are. Um, we're maybe like not quite to, not quite to be with it yet. Um, I think every time every product like this is a work in progress. Even when you get to a major release like this, um, like I was talking about, we have challenges to kind of bring people back into the fold who we might have, you know, in our kind of rush to get there, we might have alienated. Um, we have challenges to make this the thing that you you know do when you're on the phone with like a tow truck operator in the middle of the night. Um, all of those are challenges that we're, I think we moved closer to and we're, um, we built a bridge sort of halfway between those two mesas. Um, but it is sort of going in there every day and, um, and kind of continuing to use these processes to like get a little closer. So that's what I got. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.